So this is our chance to take a step back away from prostate cancer. I'll try to use full sentences and full words, not SNP and MDX and all these other acronyms. Uh, I think the Hawk Box was actually where Frank Sinatra's girlfriend danced in the Guys and Dolls. Isn't that right? Uh, so we're going to start off with asymptomatic renal stones. My disclosure here is that I like to operate. I don't necessarily like to follow patients every year with a KUB. But that aside, we'll try to cover things in terms of what the problem is, how big it is, and how best to manage these patients. So how big is the problem? We can look at a series of CT colonoscopy. In this study, they reported that almost 8% of patients who are undergoing a CT colonoscopy had a stone that they didn't know about, an asymptomatic renal stone. It was more likely to happen in men, and these weren't just single small stones. On average, the patients had two stones. They were recurrent stone formers, but they didn't know it. True, most of the stones were small, mean size or three millimeters, but some of the patients had stones up to 20 millimeters in size. What does this 7.8% mean? If we translate into how many patients could we see, 72 million CTs per year, 23 million of these are abdominal CTs, so almost two million patients a year are going to have a stone diagnosed and come to us and say, hey, what should I do? Well, we know these, these asymptomatic stones cause a lot of problems, and one of the problems is psychological stress. This WISQUAL is a questionnaire that's been developed to try to gauge the quality of life in patients with stones. And we see that if you have fragments after surgery, if you have asymptomatic stones, or if you don't have any stones, the quality of life is relatively the same. But if we focus on the question of worry, patients who have an asymptomatic stone worry about them. They worry about this ticking time bomb sitting in their kidney, waiting to drop and bring them to their knees, writhing in pain. They worry more than patients who've had a surgery and have some small residual fragments, and they certainly worry more for pa than patients who are stone-free. What do they worry about? In this study we did at the VA here in San Diego when I was here in an earlier time, we find that the risk of progression of disease, either the need for a surgery, the development of pain, the chance that the stone would grow, or any of the above, one of these things will happen over the course of three years in 77% of patients. So some patients look at this and say, oh no, something's going to happen for sure within three years. And other patients look at it and say, well, only one out of four people actually needed a surgery. So maybe I'll wait and watch and see what will happen. The risk of surgery, fairly linear drop to the point where at seven years, 50% of patients are going to need a surgery for that asymptomatic stone. And these numbers can be validated in a study from the University of Michigan where they reported that for every year of follow-up, one out of 10 patients will get pain, one out of, uh, seven out of 100 patients will need surgery, and the risk of stone growth and stone passage is similar to what we reported in our San Diego study. We found that we can further stratify the risk based on the stone size and stone location. So as an example, a small upper pole stone is more likely to pass, less likely to require surgery, whereas a stone in the renal pelvis is guaranteed to progress either with regards to intervention, pain, growth, or all of the above. We're also commonly faced with the patient with recurrent urinary tract infections. And at some point, when someone gets an imaging study, and an asymptomatic renal stone is identified, and we're asked the question, if I take out my stone, will my infections go away? We get out our coin and flip it, because half the time the answer is yes, and half the time the answer is no. When we looked at a series of patients in Cleveland, who had an asymptomatic renal stone referred with recurrent UTIs, 48% of the time the infections cleared when the stone was removed. They were more likely to clear if the infection was purely E. coli. They were less likely to clear if the infection was enterococcus. We found that the risk of persistence or recurrence of infections after surgery was higher in African Americans, higher in men with type 2 diabetes, higher in men with, with hypertension, those with enterococcus infections, and those with multidrug resistance. Again, those who solely had E. coli were more likely to resolve their recurrent UTIs when the stones were removed. 
Well, now that we've set the stage that maybe some, if not many, of these patients should be treated, the next question might be, how? If we ask the patients, what would you do for an 8 millimeter lower pole stone? Would you observe it, try shockwave, or do you ureteroscopy? Emphasizing that ureteroscopy has the highest success rate, no one chooses it. The majority of patients choose shockwave. They recognize it as a less invasive, less morbid procedure that's better for them because right now they're asymptomatic. They want to stay asymptomatic. They don't want to be calling you, and you don't want to be call them to be calling you with stent pain. One randomized clinical study from the UK where they reported that the stone free rate at two years almost approached significance. They stopped the study early before they reached their 240 patient target. But most importantly, what they showed is that by treating an asymptomatic stone preemptively with shockwave, they were able to eliminate the need for a more invasive procedure. So we counsel patients that if they want to avoid a stent, if they want to avoid a scope, that might be the reason to treat an asymptomatic stone. Well, what did patients actually do? When we looked back at 201 patients with asymptomatic renal stones, the stone free rate was tailored to the patient based on stone size, location, household units, and skin to stone distance. We find that a fairly even spread between observation, shockwave, and ureteroscopy, so perhaps not very informative to help guide us as to what patients will do in specific situations. If we tease it out to what's the success with shockwave, as long as the success for shockwaves is about 60%, the majority of patients will say, yes, I'd like to try a shockwave, and very few of them will choose ureteroscopy. It's only when the success with shockwave drops below 50%, so for that harder lower pole stone, bigger than 8 millimeters, in that situation, patients are more likely to choose the more invasive, the more painful procedure. Another way to look at this is to look at the delta. What's the difference between success rates for ureteroscopy and shockwave? We see that if ureteroscopy, for example, is 90% successful and shockwave is only 40% successful, so that would be an example of perhaps a 10 millimeter stone in the lower pole, everyone picks ureteroscopy. But they don't really start to pick ureteroscopy until that delta or difference in success rates is at least 25%. So let's take, for example, the 8 millimeter proximal ureteral stone. The AUA guidelines would tell us that success rates may be 90% for ureteroscopy. It's maybe 75% for shockwave, so the difference is only 15%. You see that the majority of patients, one out of four patients will choose ureteroscopy, but three out of four patients will choose the less invasive, less morbid procedure, even though the success rates aren't quite as good. Well, what do we have for the future? There was one study from Michigan where they looked at mobilizing stones out of the lower pole with a roller coaster. We do have something similar on the horizon from Soda Motion, a company in Seattle, that's going to be able to hopefully move stones out of the lower pole, perhaps move small stones out of the kidney. So who knows, maybe in the future we'll have a handheld device that patients take home. They've got a three millimeter stone and they move it and get it to start coming down the ureter rather than waiting for it to become five or six or seven or eight millimeters in size. The challenge at this point is that the depth of penetration is relatively poor, so we know that our skin to stone distance is usually larger as our, patient, as our patients get larger. So what would we do today? What would you do today? If it were me, if I had a four millimeter stone, I'd leave it alone. If it was four to 10 millimeters, I'd try shockwave as long as the skin to stone distance was less than 12 and the household units were less than 1,200. Otherwise, we'd cross our fingers and hope for the best. Thank you.